Hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our third and final lecture here in Chapter 18 on The Muslim World Expands. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the Mughal Empire, um, one of the more interesting empires in all of history. So let's get into it. So to understand the beginnings of this empire, you need to go back a little ways. So the Mughals, they are descendants of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. Um, and in about the year 1000, you had a bunch of Turkish armies that invaded India and established what is going to be known as the Delhi Sultanate. And these Turkish armies were Muslim and they treated the Hindus as a conquered group of people. And they're actually going to rule from the city of Delhi here for nearly 400 years. But what ends up happening is Tamerlane in his campaigns of conquest across Asia, he invades. And he destroys the city of Delhi. And this kind of leads to like kind of a power vacuum and kind of some destabilization in the region for about 100 years. And Babur, who is a descendant of Tamerlane and is coming a little bit more from the north, um, comes down into this area um, in 1494 and wins an excellent victory. And he becomes the emperor here of the Mughals in establishing this empire. So the Mughal Empire gets established in 1494. All right, so now that's kind of the beginning of it. Now we're going to jump ahead um, from Babur, who's a really important person, to perhaps the most important ruler for the Mughal Empire. And this is Akbar. And he actually gets the title of Akbar the Great. And he's one of the very few people in history that actually deserves the title the Great um, to kind of go along with people like Alexander and so forth. But he's going to rule the empire for nearly 50 years. Um, but he was both a really good military commander and a good politician. So why was he a good military commander? Well, he was really aggressive and he was able to use um, his technology effectively. He effectively used gunpowder weapons, whether it was early forms of muskets or artillery um, to help him conquer many cities, um, as well as he used elephants effectively as shock troops. The Mughals did um, throughout their throughout their rule, but he used them um, more more so than ever. Now, politically, he was very accepting of people. He was very strong ruler um, in terms of um, working with people. He was very um, adept at appointing people to the right positions, whether it was based on loyalty and skill. Um, but what also he did was he appointed Rajputs who were actually rivals, and he had fought many campaigns against the Rajputs. Uh, rulers of northern India, he appointed them actually as officers, which led them to become allies of his, um, led to more of a unification of the empire. Because the Mughal Empire is substantial. It's 100 million people, it's mostly made up of Hindu, and the Mughals are Muslim. So they need the backing of the Hindus, and the Rajputs allow that, um, that relationship to benefit and become better overall for the entirety of the empire. All right, now, a little bit more with Akbar himself. Besides being a good leader politically and militarily, he also um, preached religious freedom. Um, and this is very important, like I was just saying, with the majority of India being Hindu. Um, he allowed Hindus to be married to Muslims without conversion to Islam. He abolished the tax for all non-Muslims. So basically, you didn't pay taxes based on your religion. That was huge, especially here in India. He also gave everyone based on skill and quality of leadership and quality of their abilities um, to pos higher positions in government. So it was based on whether or not you were good. And this is important because not only that led to better leadership in a huge, huge empire, but it also led to the development of better systems, such as a very fair income tax system, which was beneficial across or equal across the empire, which led to massive amounts of wealth and um, stability in the region. And his land policies prevented the development of a feudal system. So like as we've talked about, the systems like that um, developing in places like Japan and Europe because of division, his systems that were put in place because of his abilities, because of um, allowing others and skill to develop, prevent that from happening, which is a good thing, especially in an empire so large with so many people. Now let's talk about the Mughal culture um, under Akbar the Great, he welcomed emissaries from all over the world. And this is why, another reason why he was important. 
um, because by allowing people from all over the world to come to the Mughal Empire, he not only shared his traditions um, or their traditions and cultural traits with other people, but he was able to develop and experience or have his people do experience and develop ideas and inventions and stuff from others around the world. And that's important. Um, some examples of this, we see um, languages that actually get developed um, or become prominent within um, the Mughal Empire, such as Persian, Hindi, and Urdu. Um, we see books and miniature paintings that start to flourish from cultural uh, mixture of other other groups from across the area. You see a revival in actual Hindu literature because you have this revival in learning and also religious freedom within the Mughal Empire. And architecturally, you start to see massive, intricate stone structures, and Ak Akbar actually breeds, his rule breeds a its own architectural style. I um, mean, you can see it here in this picture. Um, and it's all because of the advances and um, um, flourishing of this empire under his rule. Now, the successors of his are going to, are going to, um, have good and bad things. Now, Akbar's sons, or one of his sons, Jahangir, um, was a fairly effective ruler himself um, at times, but he eventually was kind of weak, and it was primarily because, um, and actually why he was uh, successful, was actually really because of the woman behind him. And it was his wife, Princess Nur Jahan, and Nur Jahan ruled with the Iron Fist. Um, she was very um, skilled politically, um, and she effectively was actually the real ruler. Um, and that's why I kind of said he, Jahangir was a good ruler, but it was really because of his wife. Now, there's going to be some disputes that actually exist between um, Jahangir, Nur Jahan, and their son Khusrau, which is actually going to lead to some religious conflict that's ultimately going to turn a different religious group in um, the Mughal Empire, the Sikhs, who are actually non-violent. It turns them violent for a period. And they become a target of the Mughal hatred. And this is unique because you got to think about what was going on previously in the rule of Akbar. He practiced complete religious freedom and wanted that for his people. So you're seeing a little bit of a change. Now, the next ruler is Shah Jahan, and he was the successor to Jahangir. Um, and he was very adamant at protecting his rulership. And how he did that was he assassinated all of his political rival rivals. He also, besides that, he had a passion for architecture and he had many wives, but he loved one in particular and her name was Mumtaz Mahal. Now, M Mumtaz gave birth to a bunch of children. I, it's like something like 20. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a lot. And she died during childbirth in 1631. So what Shah Jahan did was he commissioned a very beautiful tomb to be built for her to pay homage to, uh, homage to his favorite wife. And you guys know the building as the Taj Mahal, which is perhaps the most beautiful building ever built. And here you guys can see a picture of it. Um, you can see that it's in it's India, India today, obviously, um, because of the Mughals. That's where they're located. Um, but the architectural style here is clearly Muslim. You see the minarets on the side. You see the Muslim-type domes. Um, but this is a tomb. It's a memorial tomb for his wife, Mamtaz Mahal. All right. Now let's talk about some suffering. So there's going to be some issues that really start to kind of manifest themselves in the Mughal Empire, starting with Shah Jahan's rule, and they're going to continue later on. So what ends up happening is Shah Jahan killed all of his rivals, which is a good thing for him to maintain power, but it might, it's part of partly a problem because some of those people were very skilled. Also, because he was trying to expand the empire and because he had a very lavish lifestyle and also because he was a fan of architecture and all these building projects, there were high taxes and the people didn't like that. You know, never people never like taxes. And then also you have to combine the fact that India is a lot like China and that natural disasters or natural issues can hurt them very easily, especially in the form of famine and famine hits India during his rule. So it leads to some unrest across the empire. Now, in 1657, Jahan becomes ill, and a civil war breaks out between his sons, and they're trying to vie for power. Now, ultimately, what ends up happening is Aurangzeb kills his oldest brother, and then imprisons his father, and takes control of the empire. Now, Aurangzeb, he's a skilled leader. 
Um, he's effective military commander, master strategist, as a military commander, and he's a good builder. And he he expands the Mughal Empire to its greatest size. However, it's kind of it's like a house of cards. So as the empire expands to its greatest size by 1707, it's really not going to stay up for long. And it's partly because of some of the issues that we see beforehand that he took over for um, because of the civil war and so, civil wars and overextension and taxes and stuff. But it really has to do with the fact that he's oppressive. Um, he started to outlaw many activities and appointed censors um, outlawing certain, certain religious things, certain cultural um, traditions and traits and so forth. And people didn't like that. And the real big problem was, is that he brought back the tax on non-Muslims that had been ended by Akbar the Great. And with him ending this, it led to the Hindus, which are the majority of the population of India, to actually rebel. And this leads to the birth of a confederacy that's going to fight the Mughals. And that's going to be known as the Marathas or the Maratha Confederacy. Now, what ends up happening is Aurangzeb has to fight these guys. And when you fight a war, you have to have money. And this leads to more and more taxes, which leads to more and more territory that is gained um, by the Marathas and other groups. Sorry if it seems confusing there with a little bit of a typo. So ultimately what this does is it leads the Mughal Empire into a position where they're fighting a rebellious group. And this is at the time that we're going to see, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, we're going to see a new group come in. We're going to see Europeans who had been there a little bit already establishing trading posts, but now you're going to see a Europeans come into the, the subcontinent of India and start to expand that, that their influence there, in particular the British. And this is actually going to be this fighting and this downfall of the Mughals and the birth of the Maratha Confederacy is actually what's going to lead to the British coming in and gaining control. Here you can see the Mughal Empire, which is at its greatest extent here, roughly around 1700, 1707, and so forth. Um, and they control most all of the subcontinent, except for here at Gao in the southern tip and Ceylon. Now, I was already kind of talking about this a little bit here, um, but I kind of want to come back to it. They're going to fall apart. And the empire is completely drained of resources because of the taxes, because of the war, because of famine. You have over 2 million people die in India because of famine over these latter parts of the um, the rule of the Mughals. And this war of succession, there's a war of succession that actually takes place after Aurangzeb dies. So he's such a, he's an effective enough ruler to keep everything going and keep everything together. But like we see in history, when you lose at least a good ruler or somebody that's effective to keep things together, you see, you see that it falls apart fairly quickly afterwards. And now it, what happens to India is it becomes this patchwork of states. And this helps the expansion of Europeans in the subcontinent. And again, specifically Britain. And the trading posts, whether it's from Britain, France, the Portuguese, the Dutch, they start to become more and more powerful and um, have more of an influence there. It starts economically at first, and then it actually turns into full expansion. Now, where this actually starts is back during Aurangzeb's rule when he gives the Europeans control of Bombay, which you can see right here. I'm sorry, that's not right there. That's Gao. Sorry. Um, but anyways, that's all I got for you guys. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what happens with India here in the next chapter, chapter 19, and I'll see you guys in the next unit. Have a good one.